Firstly, we have to establish whether this would be something new or if it would have been this way since the start. And there are a few indicators that might surprise you. In my latest playthrough, the security breach, but it's ruined by mods video that released on Saturday, April 2nd on this channel, I made a note to point out that Freddy doesn't really seem to care when you get locked inside the pizza plex. He also seemed to care more about the fact that you got a crappy Mr. Hippo magnet as your free gift. And sounds more disappointed about that than the whole locked in and might get killed by a serial killer thing. Which begs the question, is he really all that disappointed? Obviously, if he was blatantly evil, he would have just turned us over to Vanessa, but if he was really crafty, he would gain our trust first. After all, he should have Glitch Trap's code inside him, right? Well, let's look at what he does before the doors close. He sends us to get a pass in order to free him from his green room, and then everything seems to go well. But then, for some random reason, without ever mentioning this before, he tells us that he senses we are broken and that he needs to bring us to medical so that we can get fixed up or something like that. Whether this was meant to be a nod to crying child or not doesn't matter in this case, okay? The point here is that it doesn't actually do anything. We get our run-in with Vanessa, that later gets turned into a TikTok meme, but other than that, we stay the same. We don't get healed, we don't get a band-aid, cause we could have had it from the start. We get in that booth, instantly turn around, and move the curtain to peep outside and watch that scene. After that, Freddy doesn't mention how we're still broken, and I don't know about you, but me standing in a booth isn't really gonna heal me, okay? It, it seems odd, if you ask me. Especially since now, with that little pit stop, even if you go full steam ahead making no stops, sprinting the whole time, you can't make it out of the doors. That one little interaction is the 30 seconds that we needed in order to escape out the front doors, but thanks to Freddy, now we don't make it. And you can't use his programming as an excuse for this, either. Because if we want to use programming as evidence, this man was supposed to be controlled by Afton's virus, and the glitching out should have messed him up. Plus, his coding isn't designed to scan children that are literally inside his body. If he picked up on the injury when Gregory was outside of his stomach for the first time and he was scanning us, why not take him to medical instantly, or as soon as you got out of the green room? And again, why make it seem like your coding is letting you scan a kid that's inside you, when nobody should be in there? Unless that's the point. What if Afton's virus did grab a hold of Freddy and just made everything seem like it was fine? Having an animatronic protect you and gaining the kid's trust is a lot better than just nabbing him out of nowhere. Plus, I mean, there would have been plenty of times this kid could have been gotten, particularly when Freddy gets grabbed by the Moondrop animatronic right outside of Parts and Service. You're telling me that Moondrop the daycare attendant told Vanessa that Freddy was in the parts and service room, but didn't mention that we were in the recharge station right next to parts and service. I mean, he knew, like he waved at us while taking Freddy away. But Vanessa knows that just grabbing Gregory won't accomplish Afton's true goal. So instead, what do they do? They stage a fake interrogation where Freddy once again looks like the good guy, and then she leaves through the most inconvenient way for her possible. Why would she leave to Rockstar Row when she could easily come our way and then head to the main atrium? That's where Gregory was. That's where all the animatronics have been spotting him. And then, after Vanessa leaves Freddy in parts and service so that his casing can be put on a new endo after corporate gives the go-ahead, she doesn't seem to be suspicious that he's walking around Rockstar Row. Like, who would have repaired him if not Gregory? There is literally no other living human in the Pizzaplex at this point, and the whole containment cylinder thing is so that it protects humans on the outside. Why is Vanessa so nonchalant about Freddy walking around? It was something that confused me in my first playthrough. I figured that Vanessa would just pull us out of Freddy if we got too close, but no. And a reasonable explanation to that is that she isn't sus because she knows the plan. And also, it's worth noting that Afton has spent all this time in a burnt down pizza plex that also contained his daughter, who has pulled this exact same scheme on us prior to this game, okay? So he could have picked up on it from her, either while they were burning, while she was trying to impress him, or maybe if she is controlling the blob and it's not actually Funtime Freddy. 
Just saying. And maybe I'm wrong about that, okay? It's entirely possible. I mean, after all of this, it is a FNAF game, right? Where not everything makes sense for the sake of the story that Scott wants to tell. But what about the post game? What about after we supposedly end Afton? What then? Is Freddy on the up and up? Or is there enough of Afton in there for us to be in danger? Well, it's actually a pretty interesting idea, since there is the distinct possibility that Afton is now controlling Freddy. Sure, when we haven't defeated Afton's body and he ends up possessing Freddy, we get killed instantly and Freddy gets purple eyes. However, in the actual ending to this boss fight, we supposedly stop Burn Trap. But then, the area around us starts collapsing. What if Afton was using Freddy as a means of escape, when he knew that his situation was dire? I mean, honestly, if we, if we think about this, Afton was downloading his consciousness wirelessly into Glamrock Freddy while we were fighting him. That was the whole point of the fight. But, but would it really reset to zero once he stops and tries again? Or would it just be like pausing a download? Honestly, with the kind of buffoonery in this series, I don't think we can discount the possibility that Afton was simply just putting a pause on the download and never to eventually still take over Freddy and potentially spend time with his robot son. Or maybe just escape into the world once more. Um, but like, seriously, he, he was transferring his consciousness into Glamrock Freddy by putting his hand on a monitor and not even a monitor like a dinosaur monitor at that I don't think that we can like just go like oh no he's not and he's not in Freddy he's dead he's gone forever that's no no if he can transfer his brain from an animatronic into another animatronic through touching a computer screen where he can see the guy that's no. If you think that Afton's done, you have not been paying attention to this series at all. And if you think that Glenn and Rock Freddy is safe, again, you don't know the series in the slightest. I hate that I was right about Freddy, because in the, eventually it's gonna be revealed that he's evil. I know it. Alright, first things first. Could Golden Freddy be a pure hallucination, and could that really make any sense? I mean, he seems to cause hallucinations for us, but is that him controlling them, or are they just appearing alongside him? Well, by definition, hallucinations are an experience involving the apparent perception of something not present. So they're sensory experiences that appear real, but are created by your mind. They can affect all five of your senses as well, not just sight. And for example, you might hear a voice that no one else can hear in the room, or you can see an image that isn't real, or maybe even feel the texture of something that isn't actually there. I remember that as a kid, once I either was dreaming or hallucinated my basement being filled with boulders that I had to clean out. I don't know why I thought it was my job, uh, but that kind of explains a lot now. My parents didn't see them though, and then just kept telling me to go to bed. Um, they thought I was they thought I was doing a bit or something, but this definitely explains a lot. Hallucinations, though, may be caused by mental illness, the side effect of medications, or physical illnesses like epilepsy or alcohol use. Not getting enough sleep can also lead to hallucinations. You may be more prone to hallucinations if you haven't slept in multiple days or didn't get enough sleep over longer periods of time. And it's also possible to experience hallucinations right before falling asleep, known as hypnagogic hallucinations, or right before waking up from sleep, known as hypnopompic hallucinations. Which is why sometimes you may hear a voice or something that sounds like a voice while you're dozing off. But it's also not just limited to sleep. High fevers, migraines, social isolation, seizures, terminal illness, and high levels of stress can all also cause hallucinations. And honestly, based on the first game alone, I can see why we would have high levels of stress and probably be sleep deprived. I mean, our shift is from 12 to 6 a.m. and that's only the part that we actually get to play. And I'm sure the working environment is pretty awful and we're alone the whole time, which not only increases increases the stress, but the feelings of social isolation as well. And that's only within the first game. If we want to talk about the series as a whole, we play as Michael Abdon in basically every game, with the exception of a few. So we can use this to kind of understand what's really going on. In the cutscenes to Sister Location, we learn that Michael was used as a vessel to help Ennard and whoever was inside of Ennard to escape the underground facility that's the main setting for that game. However, in the process, we end up becoming purple from all the bruising, because you know, metal parts are moving inside of us, and the neighborhood we live in ends up becoming afraid of us. See the you won't die scene for proof of that one. 
because everyone is hiding behind their homes as we walk down the street and then eventually puke entered out. They start off loving us, waving and smiling, but eventually become terrified and actively avoid us. If that's not gonna start the feeling of social isolation, I don't know what is. And I know what is. And we know that the original games have to come after these events because we're not only sent here by our father, who would have a tough time doing this trapped in a secret room, but also because of the cited reasons for being fired at the end of the original games. Odor is always listed, meaning that we've definitely been through some rough patches. And it's also worth noting that in Sister Location, where the stress, social isolation, and probably the sleep deprivation begin, Golden Freddy doesn't appear as an animatronic, but instead as a reference in the custom night menu, which can't really be considered canon, because in the actual story of the games, you wouldn't be able to customize things. So, Golden Freddy only starts showing up after Michael goes through extreme trauma, and seems to only be seen by Michael. Golden Freddy doesn't show up anywhere in promotional material for any of the restaurants, even before the Bite of 87, since him causing the Bite of 87 could be considered the reason why they stopped promoting him. But even in FNAF 2, which is just before the Bite of 87, since it may even take place during the events of that week, we don't see any art for the new Golden Freddy. While he does appear in the post Night 3 cutscene, these are also referred to as the end of night hallucinations, meaning that they obviously aren't real. But also, it's an interesting point of contention. Here you would think that the theory would start to fall apart because, well, it's a hallucination, yes. At this point in the game, we're playing as Jeremy Fitzgerald, right? And while yes, during the main five nights we play as Jeremy, more on that later, that doesn't really mean that these hallucinations have to be his. Think about how the hallucinations are being presented, okay? They're the location from the first game, a game where we know we play as Michael Afton. Much like how Michael was part robot after his sister location fiasco, and we're inside the Freddy animatronic specifically, like how Michael would associate the character with the one who ended up killing his brother. And Golden Freddy shows up as another hallucination on top of that. These hallucinations are clearly meant to show us how Michael is figuring out what to do next. And not only are they showing the next location that he would go to, they're also what brings him to the FNAF 2 location. Notice how he sees the puppet after Night 4 in game, and then we don't really get another end night cutscene. Simply because by Night 6, we're actually playing as Mike. Sure, we get a check that says that Jeremy worked overtime, but really? Making or even letting an employee work overtime after one of your animatronics removed his frontal lobe? Yeah, no, uh, that, that check is cleverly disguised hush money from an already shady company. Michael gets there on night six and takes over only to get fired shortly thereafter. On the pink slip, it says on the first day, really? But that seems to be one of those, I think thou doth protest too much kind of things. Like, why do you feel the need to point that out on this pink slip? The notes section is for reasoning behind the firing and explanations, especially in a legal sense. So those who get fired can't really try and file wrongful termination suits, or at least if they do, they won't really have much legs. We also know that Fritz Smith is Michael Afton using an alias since he gets fired for the same reasons Michael does in the first game. The logical extension of that being that they're the same person, who had to change their name again when they applied to the next place because, you know, the company would have a record of Fritz Smith being fired. And considering how Fritz is one of the missing children's names, yeah, it's meant to be a fake name. Nobody other than Mike seemingly can see Golden Freddy, and whenever we do see him, it's never operational, and it's never in a tangible sense. In all forms, Golden Freddy is slumped over, there's no light in his eyes, and he's always in our office. We don't see him on a camera at any point, so where the hell on earth could he have come from if he is using supernatural abilities to move himself? Some explain this in the first game by saying that he was hiding out in the kitchen since the camera wasn't working, but in FNAF 2, we don't have any cameras that aren't functional, so where on earth could he have come from? It just, it doesn't make sense even with the FNAF universe logic. Hell, we even see Shadow Freddy on the cameras, but not Golden Freddy. Huh. Weird. Speaking of his weird abilities, what's with the whole crashing us to the desktop thing? Every other animatronic sends us to the main menu, but Golden Freddy sends us to our desktop. That's a very odd detail that I don't think anyone is really questioning, but it certainly seems to indicate that there is something special about this character. And I don't think that it's that they're, they're just angrier than the other ones, because that wouldn't really change anything. I think it's more symbolic than that. You see, the only other character that when killing us crashes us 
to our desktop is Nightmare from FNAF 4, and that is not a coincidence. FNAF 4 is where we see the inciting moment that starts all of this trauma for Michael, where he feels guilty for getting his brother killed despite it not really being his fault. Sure, he put his brother's head in the animatronic mouth, but William is the one who made the mouth intentionally superpowered. When I've said this in the past, in, in previous videos, at one point someone used the analogy of if someone puts your hand under a hydraulic press and then your hand is crushed, it's not the person who made the hydraulic press's fault. And you know what? You're right, that's true. However, if that hydraulic press was designed to stop before it reached the hand, or it wasn't supposed to have enough power to actually crush a hand, then the manufacturer who gave it too much power or messed it up, it's them at fault. Or I guess, technically, a better analogy would be if your car's airbags don't deploy during an accident, since that's more realistic than a hydraulic press stopping. <laughs> in a settlement reached following mediation, attorneys Alan Feldman, Daniel Mann, and Edward Goldis obtained a multi-million dollar recovery on behalf of a teenage girl who suffered catastrophic brain injuries in a car accident. Her car slid off the road during a rainstorm and struck a tree broadside, and the head curtain airbags and the chest and thorax airbags in the vehicle failed to deploy during the accident. They could prove that if the car had been manufactured correctly, the girl wouldn't have suffered any injuries, and thus the company settled instead of taking it to court. The same principle applies here. Had this not have been William's own child, if the family who lost their kids sued William, he would have been cleaned out. But of course, Michael didn't know that it wasn't his fault at the time. He learned that after sister location, which sets him on his journey. But going back to the connection between Golden Freddy and Nightmare, they're the only two animatronics that crashes to the desktop. And while with Golden Freddy that may not make much sense, with Nightmare having the same ability, it sets a baseline for what's really going on when this happens. Nightmare and FNAF four is representative of death. He's the dark shadow that's coming after crying child during his coma in the hospital after the bite of 83. Notice how Nightmare is a shadow version of Nightmare Fredbear. Fredbear being the animatronic that he would be most afraid of because, you know, it's the one that crushed him. And his ultimate custom night voice lines support this idea. Quote, I am here to claim what is left of you. You will not be spared, you will not be saved, and I am your wickedness made of flesh. All of these are indicators that Nightmare is meant to be death, especially in FNAF 4. And when Nightmare gets us, we crash to the desktop. We truly die. Not like when the other animatronics get us and we go back to the main menu. This time around, we're actually jump scared to death. The same must be the case for Golden Freddy. And considering how Nightmare is in essence also a hallucination, it would make sense for Golden Freddy to be able to jump scare us to death as well. A death that doesn't involve violence, and instead your heart giving out due to fear, hence the desktop crash. Golden Freddy being a hallucination would not only explain a lot, but it would also help clear things up. Golden Freddy being a real animatronic allows for Cassidy to be the one you should not have killed, since she can possess William without us having to worry about who's in the suit. The It's Me line also makes sense now, since it would be referring to the animatronic that killed Mike's brother, or it could even be Mike assuming that Crying Child went on to possess the Freddy bear animatronic because Mike knows that Elizabeth is possessing baby and it makes sense why we can't see Golden Freddy on the cameras, why he's never advertised, but also why he would be haunting William in Ultimate Custom Night, since William would also see Golden Freddy as the one who took his son. Well, at least if it is William in Ultimate Custom Night, since with this revelation now, it could be Mike. Cassidy could still be possessing William, but someone else may be possessing Michael, causing him to suffer since he blames his big brother for his death. Michael being the ultimate custom night player explains why we would still see Golden Freddy in the final cutscene, it makes sense with the dialogue of the ultimate custom night death screens, and it explains why Spring and Scrap Trap are there, because why would William be haunting himself? He doesn't seem to regret anything he's done. Michael being possessed by Crying Child explains why he knows what Nightmare Fredbear looks like, since he draws it in the survival logbook, and it explains why Cassidy and Crying Child could communicate in that book, not because they share an animatronic, but because they share a purpose, to punish those who did them wrong, or I guess to punish those they consider the causes for their death. And then it allows for Michael to be possessing Glamrock Freddy for his redemption, because Crying Child was keeping him alive through FNAF 6's fire. While I may have had prior bias to the idea that Crying Child is the vengeful spirit, aka the one you should not have killed, I really do want to get to the bottom of this, genuinely. So when researching for Cassidy, I was keeping an open mind and using every source that I could. Multiple things stuck out to me 
as being commonly referred to as evidence for Cassidy. The final scene of Ultimate Custom Night where Golden Freddy is twitching after you beat 5020 mode. The survival logbook which seemingly contains conversations between Crying Child and Cassidy. The voice lines you can hear behind the mediocre melodies sound like a girl, like the, the ones that play slightly after the main mediocre melodies ones. And William actually killed Cassidy directly as far as we can tell, whereas Michael put Crying Child in Fredbear's mouth. And these are some good points, and not something to discount. These are also the points that made me believe that Cassidy was the one you should not have killed originally as well. There's also the point that when the animatronics refer to the character as he, they're simply referring to the Golden Freddy animatronic since Golden Freddy is a male character. As well as Cassidy's name containing the Cass prefix, which means curly haired and Gaelic. And the character of Andrew, who represents the ventral spirit in the Fazbear Fright story The Man in Room 1280, has curly black hair. There's also the two eye theory from FNAF 3. The two eye theory states that in the FNAF 3 bad ending, there are two eyes lit up in the head and the back, which we assume to be Golden Freddy to show that there are two souls inside the animatronic. I do have rebuttals for Crying Child points as well, alright, so don't worry, but I feel like it's important to not only talk about the evidence, but also give countering points to it as well. These are mostly coming from my brain, but after over 350 FNAF videos on my own, I feel like I am more than qualified to discuss this. The Golden Freddy final scene in Ultimate Custom Night can easily be explained away if you do believe the two souls theory, since if it was Crying Child in the suit as well, this would make sense. It could also be due to the fact that he was put in a coma by the Fredbear animatronic, which is a golden bear like Golden Freddy. The he pronoun being used to describe the vengeful spirit is a really hit to the Cassidy theory as well, since why would they be describing the gender of an animatronic when they're talking about the kid that died? Especially when thanks to the mediocre melodies, we know that these animatronics are just saying the things that they're made to say by the one you should not have killed. Meaning the spirit is really the one using these pronouns, so why wouldn't they use their own and instead use the animatronics? The voice lines sound like a girl because well, they're voiced by a girl. The casting call on Voices.com was very general and said that the actress could lean towards either a male or a female. The survival logbook having two spirits doesn't really have anything to do with Cassidy being a vengeful spirit. And the cast prefix, while yes meaning curly haired and Gaelic, seems to me like a bit of a stretch. The whole name of Cassidy is Irish in origin and means the clever one. The origin of this name is also 65% Irish and only 5% Gaelic, meaning if we want to go off meaning, we should be going with the majority, which would be the clever one, which really doesn't do anything to help this theory. And the 2i theory has been debunked by us in the past in its own video and also on my Instagram in a reel. However, I'll go over it here. In an interview with Daco, Scott confirmed that while making FNAF 3, it was intended to be the finale, that there was no intended next game. Meaning that at that point, there were no other characters that could possess Golden Freddy. The lights being on in both eyes is simply because the light is bouncing off the inside of the head and to show us that it actually is an animatronic head that was supposed to be Freddy, since if it was only one eye, it could also kind of look like Bonnie. Or hell, if it's only one eye, we would have thought that it was another Foxy. Now, there is a lot more evidence for Crying Child in my opinion, okay? Whenever I asked others who thought that it was Cassidy, why they thought it was Cassidy Instead, they all ended up giving me the same points. That Cassidy was killed directly, the two souls theory, and the gender confusion of the animatronic. Typically, nothing additional was added, okay? I'm sorry, it's just how it went. So, now let's go over some of the evidence I gathered for Crying Child's case. Cassidy was released in the Happiest Day minigame in FNAF 3, hence why the original animatronics don't appear in FNAF 6 when Henry is trying to put everything involving Fazbear Entertainment to rest. If Cassidy is at rest as well, she cannot be possessing William. The spirit possessing William also from what we've seen in the games cannot be possessing both him and the Golden Freddy animatronic. If he can possess multiple things, then the two souls theory helps explain that as well. Despite two souls and multiple possessions coming out of seemingly nowhere as far as the games are concerned, Concerned. As I said, the casting call also said whoever got the part could lean towards a male or a female voice. And considering how Tabitha Skeynes, the actress who got the part, is female, it would make sense for her to lean towards a female voice. It's also worth noting that most prepubescent male characters have female voice actors. Danny Phantom, Timmy Turner, Ash Ketchum, all these characters have female voice actors because they're young. So the same would be the case for Crying Child. The appearance of the Nightmare animatronics in FNAF 4 as well also seems to be impossible unless the one creating that situation, the Vengeful Spirit, had seen them before. And since FNAF 4 was a dream, as confirmed by Ultimate Custom Night, 
it in lines like, this is a nightmare you won't wake from, Crying Child is the only one to have seen these animatronics. Crying Child also dies in a hospital after suffering through the agony of his coma nightmare, which would give him the power to latch onto something nearby, which would have most likely been his father. There's also weaker evidence like the fact that the image used for the vengeful spirit is just a blown out image of Scott's son, which could be a parallel to William's son. Andrew from The Man in Room 1280 is also a male, and while yes, Michael put Crying Child's head into the robot, William was the one who made the robot and also made it powerful enough to crush a skull, whereas a normal animatronic would be unable to do so. Which is what Michael assumed would happen. He didn't think that it was gonna kill his brother. Something that Map Hat also agrees with. If, like some commenters have said, they only care about what he says and not the actual evidence. And while there is more evidence for Crying Child, there are also some things that don't have clean answers. The same is true for Cassidy. Cassidy might not have been released in the Happiest Day minigame, despite it seemingly being the case. The Nightmare animatronics also do appear in FNAF VR, which could have been due to the scanning of the hard drive that created Glitchtrap, who had seen the nightmares at this point, but it doesn't explain the fact that Michael drew Nightmare Fredbear in the survival logbook, unless this is something that he drew beforehand and then showed to Crying Child, hence why they showed up in his dreams, but that involves assumptions that I'm just not comfortable making. Crying Child does die in a hospital, however, while we haven't really seen proof that you can possess something far away in the games, we also technically haven't seen proof that says you can't. In my personal opinion, the, the lack of evidence is in and of itself evidence against that, but I guess I can see why others wouldn't be so quick to accept that. The same idea with possessing multiple things. The whole image being of Scott's son thing is kind of weak, but considering that the FNAF 4 home was also decorated with images of his family, I'd actually like to think that this is more important than we realize. Because sure, using his own assets is cheaper than buying them, but this seems very deliberate. If the images in the FNAF 4 home were supposed to be of William and his family, and they were of Scott's family, and then Scott's son is used for something else, uh, yeah. But people will hone in on how that is circumstantial. The biggest rebuttal for Crying Child, however, is that William didn't kill him, Michael did. And since Crying Child is William's son, he wouldn't want to torture his dad. And while this can be true, we have to remember that Crying Child is again also a child, who most likely saw his sister get scooped by baby, who got scared when he saw his father putting a worker into the Fredbear suit, and one of Scott's hints from that live stream oh so long ago was what is seen in shadows is often misunderstood in the mind of a child. Even without seeing William give the superpower he needed to the animatronic in order to make it a killbot, Crying Child knows that William is making killbots. He knows that he made Baby, and he knows that William made Fredbear. So getting killed by the animatronic wouldn't necessarily be Michael's fault, it would be William's. Much like how Elizabeth's death was his fault as well. And being family doesn't mean that you can't dislike or even hate those people, okay? Being related to you doesn't automatically give people a free pass for doing horrific acts. If my father was a serial killer, who killed my little sister, and then killed me using overpowered animatronics, you best believe I'm coming back with a vengeance. And also, just one final point in general, in that interview with Daco that is still available on Daco's channel, Scott said that FNAF 3 was intended to be the final game. This question is presented 21 minutes into the video if you want to actually look at the timecode, when asked about which ending of FNAF 3 is canon. However, Scott also refuses to answer that question, because he knows how passionate the community gets, and cites the argument over Mangle's gender as a reason why he won't answer it. He says that it's complicated. And to me, this sounds like it's because what people generally understand in this series would be countered by which ending is canon. The good ending would have released Cassidy's soul, which would in turn make it impossible for her to be the vengeful spirit, since that minigame was in fact not Crying Child, okay? He hadn't been introduced yet. And according to a recent community poll, which actually inspired this video, the generally accepted idea is that Cassidy is the vengeful spirit. So if he had countered that, everyone would have all been up in a tizzy, okay? This was also after Ultimate Custom Night had been released, so. Yeah. Well, the concept of multiple Earths is fairly simple, kind of, honestly put. For every moment, there is a world where every outcome exists, although they don't all exist at the same time. Using the common cereal metaphor instead of Schrodinger's cat, in the morning, you wake up to sit down for breakfast. You have multiple cereal options in front of you. Apple Jack, Cinnamon Toast Crunch, and Lucky Charms. There is an equal possibility for you to pick either one of them, and those possibilities exist on their own. But only by picking your cereal 
world do you know what universe you end up in? Okay, I guess it's simple if you're obsessed with this kind of stuff like I am. However, what this doesn't explain is that there's a world where you don't eat breakfast. There's also one where you have Eggos instead. Or hell, there's one where you finally eat those damn freezer burnt pancakes that are staring at you for months sitting at the back of your freezer. All of those possibilities exist. And simply put, when you make a decision, you pick which branch of reality you go down, but the others still happen. So applying this to FNAF, we know that there are multiple endings, but only a single canon ending. Because this is the ending that continues this branch of reality. The branch where we free the spirits of the missing children in FNAF 3 instead of letting them suffer eternally. The one where we go to the scooping room in Sister Location instead of going home and letting Ennard escape on its own. These are the branches that Scott deems as the one our character follows, but all other possibilities still happen. So there is a world that follows the spirits not being released, and the universe where we do save Vanny from Glitchtrap's grasp. It just so happens that these aren't the stories that we follow any further. Okay, but why does this matter? Because if FNAF ever ends up running out of ideas for how to continue this story, they've perfectly set up a way to revitalize the entire series without having to worry about rewriting the established lore. FNAF Security Breach has seven endings. That is six other game possibilities that we have yet to see. That might not be made, but also might be made. Like what happens after the worst ending, when Gregory isn't around to try and fix everything? What happens after the rooftop ending, the van ending, or my personal favorite, the phaser blast ending, since it's the first ending I got, meaning that, to me at least, it's my ending. It's my canon ending. The way my Gregory worked was that he went after Vanny. These can all be explored without impacting the main continuity. Hell, they can even test things that they don't want to put in the main canon of the game. Okay, I shouldn't say that. It would be canon, but it wouldn't be in the main continuity. Like, since, like, canon and continuity are different. But that's only potential, I can hear you saying. Which, firstly, are you complaining about me telling you how we can possibly get more FNAF games? That's a bit confusing. But also, well, yeah, they're potential games. It's not like they've announced any other games outside of the main FNAF continuity. Right? Right? Wrong. Remember that old gem, the Fazbear Fanverse Initiative? Oh yeah, baby, that's right. I thought the joy of creation made this into our world? No. This is just one of the branches, one of the variants for those of you who watch the Loki series on Disney+. Plus. While yes, they take place in their own universe and are not a part of the main FNAF continuity, that doesn't mean that they aren't a part of another branch. The question is, which one? Well, technically, each of the FNAF games has two endings at least. The one where you survive the Five Nights and the one where you die. But to know what ending we are following with these fanverse games, we must figure out what the hell is going on. Firstly, the first FNAF game is getting a remake called Five Nights at Freddy's Plus. Along with that, some older games of the various series will be remade due to them using assets that were either copyrighted or made by uninvolved people. This has to be done for the other part of the project, releasing these series for sale on console and mobile devices in series bundles. Series involved will also end up producing official merchandise like U2's collectibles and plush toys, hopefully Funko Pops. While it is clear that the Fazbear Fanverse games are confirmed to be officially part of the FNAF franchise as a whole, they will remain in their own continuity, okay? So they have like a whole separate timeline, which is why they are getting the FNAF Plus. Although Pop Goes and Five Nights at Candy's are confirmed to take place in the same universe. So Pop Goes and Five Nights at Candy's are in the same universe as each other. So focusing on FNAF and Pop Goes lore, the description for the first FNAF game states that Freddy Fazbear's new pizzeria has closed for good, and so another restaurant is going to take its place in the world of entertainment, meaning that we're either dealing with the same closure that made Circus Babies, which exists outside of the games at the moment, or we're dealing with the 1993 closure after the first game. Considering how the first game is also getting a remake and FNAF was released after the first game before Circus Babies was even a thing, we can guess that it's about the 1993 closure. Pop Goes, however, gives us a little bit more. A year after the fire at Fazbear's Fright, a rich and creative inventor in England, only known as Fritz, has taken the role of continuing the animatronic pizzeria brand with his own restaurant called the Pop Goes Pizzeria. Sporting extremely advanced robotic characters such as Pop Goes the Weasel and Blake the Badger, the place soon became notable for being technologically ahead of its time. So this game takes place one year after FNAF 3, which should be taking place in 2023 since it opens 30 years after the FNAF 1 pizzeria closed. And the story summary on Pop Goes' wiki 
confirms this. Quote, Pop Ghost takes place in November 2024. The first night happens on the 25th of November. A few days before the game started, Fritz Glade, who is the creator and owner of the Pop Goes Pizzeria, accidentally murdered his daughter, Bonnie Glade, in a PTSD attack. Now her soul is haunting the Pop Goes Pizzeria, waiting for a body she can possess, the Black Rabbit. End quote. But considering how the fire happens after night 6 in FNAF 3, which you can access after either the good or the bad ending, we can't be sure which branch we are actually in here. Since we managed to make it to FNAF 3, since Pop Goes and FNAF take place in the same universe, at least those two take place in the same universe, others might be confirmed to also take place in that same universe. I feel like all the fanverse games in this series should be in the same timeline, but hey, I mean, I don't really know how they can work with Joy of Creation. <laughs> but we have to assume that we beat FNAFs 1 and 2, and considering how Springtrap never makes an appearance in Five Nights at Candy's or Pop Goes, I'm guessing that in that instance, this time Springtrap was actually burned. Thus, the story of the main FNAF continuity would be over, which would make sense since it allows for the actual stories of these games to shine without us worrying about the rest of the FNAF story and how it affects these games, how they end up getting to security breach and all that, which I think is probably the best course of action to take. However, I'm definitely looking forward to FNAF pop figures because I want a monster rat Funko in my life. I feel like I need it. Or like the ignited animatronics from the joy of creation. That would be dope. I want that. I want all four of those. I want ignited Springtrap because that one was sick from the Halloween edition.